And now, please welcome our journalists who in turn will welcome our candidates. Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to Seattle City Club's District 6 City Council debate. My name is Angela King. I am with KUOWFM. I am joined tonight by my fellow journalist, Natalie Swaby of King 5 News, and Jim Berner of the Seattle Times. And also joining us tonight are the candidates vying for your vote in District 6. But before we introduce them, again, a thanks to our sponsors, our presenting sponsor, Amazon, our supporting sponsor, AARP, the host, Finney Neighborhood Association. And now I would like to introduce the stars, so to speak, of tonight's debate. They are Heidi Wells and Daniel Strauss. Please help me welcome them to the stage. Now, as we get them prepared with the microphones, I would like to provide a quick introduction of each candidate at this time. Starting with candidate Dan Strauss. Candidate Strauss was born and raised in Ballard and brings decades worth of legislative experience to his District 6 bid. He has worked as the Chief Policy Advisor to outgoing District 7 Council Member Sally Bagshaw and was a legislative aide to State Senator David Frocht. He's also worked with the Oregon State Legislature and the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. Within his more than 10 years of legislative experience, Candidate Strauss is proud of his work with state, county, city, and local groups to fund transportation projects, develop green building codes, and improve local parks. And among his campaign goals, connect bus and bike lanes, support small business, expand affordable child care programs, and affordable housing in the city. Candidate Strauss, this is his introduction. Moving on to Candidate Wills. She has lived in District 6 with her husband and three children for 17 years now. She was first elected to the Seattle City Council back in 1999 and during that time chaired the Energy and Environmental Policy Committee overseeing Seattle City Light. She's also served as a King County Legislative Staffer. Since then, she, has, she is the founder and executive director of the First T of Greater Seattle for 13 years and this is a youth development program that teaches children life lessons and character building through the game of golf. And uh, among her campaign goals, creating better mobility and more transportation choices, infrastructure improvements, public safety, improving local parks, environmental sustainability, affordable housing in areas that are able to absorb them. This is candidate Heidi Wells. Now just a quick layout of the rules for tonight's debate. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to answer each of the questions presented by myself and my fellow journalist. That'll be followed by a lightning round where candidates will respond either yes, no, or waffle and will do so by holding up a card. <laughs> we do provide that option of waffle just in case. And uh, then we will finish the debate with a 90 second closing statement from each of our candidates. And uh, just so the candidates know, your responses will be timed, and we will let you know when you have gone over that time. And again, to our audience members, if you could please withhold your applause until the very end. And again, uh, just respect the rules that have been laid out by Seattle City Club. So now we begin with the question round. Each candidate, again, will have 60 seconds to answer. And the first question comes from Seattle Times reporter Jim Brunner. Hello. There's uh, some sense some people are looking at this uh, upcoming election as somewhat of a change election. Obviously, we've had a number of incumbent city council members reading the polls and deciding not to run again. Um, candidate Strauss, given that you're an aide to a, to a city council member, and Candidate Wills, you yourself had been on the city council, albeit some time ago, what's your case that you're going to bring something new to the table, and what would that be? What new ideas or attitude would you bring to the council? You know, I've, I think what distinguishes me um, is that I've served on the Seattle City Council. So I've done this job and I don't feel like I can sit on the sidelines when there are so many issues facing our community from affordable housing to mobility to addressing the root causes of homelessness and taking care of basic services of municipal government. Since being on the council, I've been a small business owner, growing a business to 65 employees in our community. 
I'm a working mom. We haven't had a mom raising teenagers on the city council for the last, for, in this millennium. And I think that's an important lens to bring. And I've served as a leader in South Seattle working with youth, directing a nonprofit in our community. These are all um, missing voices currently on the city council. And I think that it shows. And because I've been a leader in our community for three decades, serving uh, the community on issues that really matter, I, I'm a problem solver and I'm solution based. I can hit the ground running. Candidate Strauss. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I'm, my name is Dan Strauss. I was born and raised in Ballard. I went to Adams and Whitman, and I have a lifetime of understanding of where our community has come from. I've also got a really strong vision of where we can go in the future. Because I have had the opportunity to work at council, this is the shortest stint I've ever worked as a policy advisor in any of the three legislative bodies I've ever worked in. I know where the obstacles are. I know where the roadblocks are, and I know how to, where the opportunities are to get things done. Oftentimes, uh, stakeholders or departments or other offices will try and play tricks on the people at city council. And I've already had those tricks tried to be played on me, and I know how to get the job done starting on day one. Um, I'm the turnkey candidate, and I know where we can move through the obstacles to get the solutions for you as residents of our district. I was born and raised here, and I look forward to sh shaping the future of our community. A quick follow-up, um, and partly because we got a number of questions along this line. Um, there was some dissatisfaction with the outgoing council member, Mike O'Brien, in this district. And could each of you speak briefly to um, how you think he maybe could have possibly served his constituents better, or is there something that you would do that he did not? I've been uh, doorbelling a lot in District 6. I've hit over 21,000 homes in our community, and people are deeply dissatisfied with this city council. I think that they feel as though their voices um, don't matter and are not being heard. Um, I think that th there's a lot of polarization happening on a whole host of issues, um, including public safety and addressing homelessness um, with real solutions. Um, I think that with regards to transportation, there's also people picking sides rather than coming at it with a balanced approach. Um, so I, I feel that it's important to be a convener, uh, to listen to all stakeholders, and I have broad support in my campaign from labor, from business, from progressive leaders in our community, and I think it's um, important to bring that perspective and also that experience to the table to bring people together. And candidate Wills, could I have you specifically address the issue of what you would do differently than what uh, Councilman Mike O'Brien had done? Uh, there was uh, legislation called shelter in place to allow people sleeping in tents in our public parks. Um, I think that that's problematic. Um, I think that it's unsafe and unhygienic for people living in those conditions and for the people living around them. And I think that we need to rely on the navigation team, which is the only tool the city has to bring services to people who are most vulnerable in our community and get them into housing so they can move on with their lives. Thank you, Candidate Wills. Candidate Trouse. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I share a lot of the same values as our current council member, and I do things very differently. The environment is extremely important. I got hit while I was riding my bicycle by a driver, and I understand the importance of having protected bike lanes in the right places to have a connected bike network. These are things that we need to address today as our city, and I do them very differently. That's why on day one of this campaign, I said that I would open a district office because you don't need to go downtown to have your voice heard. You don't need to go downtown to have the services the city provides at your doorstep. And that's something that I want to do as your next council member, is to be available to you whenever you need to, have, to, to either speak your mind or receive services, navigate the city's bureaucracy. It can be a very cumbersome bureaucracy, and I want to be there to serve you. Look, when we're talking about you know, natural gas, this is the latest proposal by the council member, you don't just run at things straight on like we saw in these last couple weeks there is a process that was outlined at the state level on how you bring in stakeholders how you have conversations how you call people in to solve the problems together and that's how we should be doing things 
look, just because I share the values with them doesn't mean that I share the process. I think that we need to work collaboratively as a community and have everyone sitting at the table to find the solutions that works for all of us. Thank you, Candidate Strauss. Moving on to our next topic, and Candidate Wills, you briefly addressed this, um, but we will begin and address this question to Candidate Strauss first. You've both talked about the urgency to address Seattle's homeless crisis. What do you see as the biggest issue currently being neglected by the city, and what's one idea that is different that you plan to bring to the table to solve the issue? Candidate Strauss, please. Great, thank you. We need to have a housing first approach, and that means bringing people inside four walls, a door that they can lock that's connected to the services that they need, whether that's managed encampments or transitional housing. We know that we need to stabilize folks so that and connect them with the services so that we don't continue having folks fall into crisis, intervening with them, and then them falling back into crisis and going in a circular manner and continually re-intervening with people. We need to stabilize people and get them the services that they need. That's for chemical dependency, that's for mental health. The folks need to be able to feel comfortable, safe, in a warm and dry place uh, because the current system that we're engaging with isn't working. We need permanent supportive housing and we need affordable housing. When we talk about the navigation team, the navigation team is only as successful as the services that we have to offer. And we currently don't have enough places for people to come inside to be warm, safe, and dry, and connected to the services that they need. Candidate Wills. Uh, we know that the system is too fragmented. And it's even hard for caseworkers to navigate the system. Uh, the city needs to work more collaboratively with regional and state leaders to address the root causes of homelessness. We need to rely on the state for more funding for mental health. We are 49th out of 50 states on how much we are spending on mental health. That's unacceptable. We need to have more mental health counselors in our public schools. We need to start early with youth. One in three kids are showing signs of anxiety disorder in our schools in numbers we've never seen before. We also need to work with the county to provide more treatment on demand. Now, if someone uh, would like to seek treatment, it's very difficult to find treatment on demand. We know what the solutions are. We also need more short-term solutions of modular homes and more long-term solutions of permanent supportive housing. But people deserve a plan from regional leaders to know how we're going to address this with a continuum of care so we can really help the people most vulnerable in our community. And I'd like to ask a follow-up question of each of you. Please, as briefly as you can respond, we would appreciate it for time's sake. Is the city currently using tax revenue properly to address this issue? You know, there's always efficiencies to be found, and we need to continue looking at those efficiencies. We need to have performance-based metrics, and we need to make sure that those metrics are correct. Because just saying, you know, bringing somebody who's living on the street into a house, it doesn't necessarily work like that. We need to make sure that our metrics do look at how we are graduating people out of the situation that they are in into the home that they are in. We need to have performance metrics so that we can identify which programs are working well and which ones aren't and continue to fund the ones that are only working well. Candidate Wills. When I was on the city council, we were spending about 10 million to address homelessness. I was vice chair of the Housing and Human Services Committee. Now the city is spending $94 million. And I think people would like to have more accountability and transparency with that spending. They want to know what's working and what's not. We need and deserve data-driven solutions so that we're really helping people who need it most in our community. Thank you. Mayor Durkin's administration has increased the number of unauthorized encampment removals called sweeps. Do you support the continued practice of removing unauthorized camps? Why or why not? And Candidate Strauss, please answer first. Yeah, unless there's a public safety or public health reason, we're just using our dollars inefficiently because we don't have a place for people to go. We need to make sure that we have the proper shelter we need to make sure that we have the proper transitional housing. We need to have a place for navigation teams to be graduating people into. Otherwise, navigation teams are just spending our money unnecessarily, and that's money that we could be building housing, building transitional housing, or providing the services that I've heard from our community that are needed. 
Candidate Wills. Yes, the navigation team is really the only tool that the city has to help people find the services that they need. And we talk about people experiencing homelessness as if it's a monolithic group. And there are as many reasons why someone may be experiencing homelessness as there are people in our community. And we need to ensure that we have all the pieces in place to serve people so that they find themselves somewhere on that continuum of care to exit homelessness. Um, we need more short-term solutions like permanent, I mean like modular homes, and we need permanent solutions like permanent supportive housing, which has been found to be the most cost effective for the public. We know for the same amount of money, we can spend um, either three days for someone to be in jail, we can spend the same amount of money for three uh, months, uh, I'm sorry, for someone to be in jail, three days for someone to be in an uh, emergency room, or for one entire year of permanent supportive housing. We know that's what works. Candidate Wills, could you just answer this part of it? Do you believe more sweeps are needed? So sweeps, I feel like, is a loaded term. And I think what's needed is people moving out of homelessness into a continuum of care to find themselves exiting homelessness and we know what works it's permanent supportive housing and we know until we have enough permanent supportive housing for the people who need it we need temporary housing we need 24 hour uh, seven days a week shelter for people we need low barrier shelter for people we need a pl places where people can bring their pets and couples can go um, so uh, in order to move people on that continuum of care we need the navigation teams to go thank to work you. thank you According to the King County Medical Examiner, in 2014, 87 unsheltered people died in King County. In three years, by 2017, that was up to 169 deaths, while the unsheltered population rose by 76%. Can you describe what your response would be to this emergency? How would you reverse this trend, and how quickly? Candidate Strauss, you can go first. Yeah, we need to build more housing. We need more affordable housing, and we need more permanent supportive housing. We know that 50% of the area median income is about $38,000. The kids that I grew up with here in our community can't afford to live in our community. I can barely afford to rent in my community. Uh, my parents are still homeowners here. I'm a renter. Uh, so we need to make sure that we're not lever leveraging all of these tax dollars on property owners and sales tax, and we need to build this housing. That's in part why mandatory housing affordability was so important. It's, a, it's why the housing trust fund from the state was funded at historic levels. We need to build deeply affordable housing that's 30% to 60% uh, of the area median income. Uh, and we need to have permanent supportive housing so that people don't, who are chronically homeless don't continue to fall into that cycle. People are dying in the streets. And we seem to be fiddling our thumbs. We know the uh, number of people experiencing homelessness on our streets have uh, disabilities that they're veterans, that they're people experiencing mental illness, and they are utilizing our emergency rooms in high numbers, which is costly to the public, because they don't have any alternatives. Uh, we know that permanent supportive housing works, that we, people need caseworkers so that they are met as the client um, where their need is. Um, I've had an opportunity to tour a number of permanent supportive housing places in our community. Um, DESC has a wonderful one called Estelle in South Seattle. Everyone deserves to be safe, warm, and dry, and to have health care, and to, ha to be warm um, at night when they sleep, and not worry about someone stealing their belongings or harming them. And we know permanent supportive housing is what's needed in order to address the root causes of homelessness. All right, moving on to our next topic, specifically addressing public safety, which kind of bleeds into the prior subject matter. The Seattle Police Department is struggling to hire and retain police officers. Exit interviews suggest officers feel caught in the middle between complaints from members of the public and the city's efforts to not criminalize homelessness. They also say they don't feel supported by Seattle officials and council members as well. So how would you bridge this perceived gap real or perceived? I will uh, address that question to candidate Strauss. Yeah, thank you. We need to hire more police officers. I mean, that's, that's a, something that we all know. We can look at the statistics. We can look at the data. We know that we need to have more police officers. We need to have more police officers walking the beat, having relationships with the people in their community. 
Um, and that goes for the council members as well. I would work with the Seattle Police Foundation to find ways that support the police officers in the, in the best ways possible. I was just chatting with some folks at the back of the room before this all started. Seattle Police Foundation, uh, when the Seahawks won the Super Bowl and the police had to come out and provide extra security, there wasn't enough turnaround time to get special Seahawks logos for the Seattle Police Department, right? So Seattle Police Depart Foundation came in and made sure that there was a quick turnaround on Seahawks logoed Seattle Police Department hats. I mean, it's, I know that is such a small thing, but these are examples of ways that, the, that I would work with the Police Foundation to find those gaps that police officers need to have filled. And I would work with them to feel, know that they are supported by our community and work with our community. Candidate Wells. I feel like this is another issue that has polarized our community. And I think that we can have both police accountability and civilian oversight. At the same time, we can support the men and women who are serving in our police department. Um, I think it's true that morale is low just based on the police officers that I've doorbelled in District 6, and that's been four of them so far. Um, we're, we know that we're having a hard time retaining police officers, and our vacancy rate is about 10%, and that's stretching the police department too thin, which is adding more stress to already very stressful jobs. We also know that we need to reflect the community that we serve within the police department. We need to recruit more women and more people of color um, to, re to build trust and relationships with the people being served by our police department. Um, I think that this is one of the most critical issues facing District 6. People are almost shouting at me as I'm at the door that this is a top priority for them to prioritize pr public safety. Staying on the topic of public safety, jurors and courthouse employees have described assaults, drug abuse, and the feeling of being unsafe along 3rd Avenue. If elected, how would you address the issues being described on 3rd Avenue? Candidate Wills, you first. Well, again, I think that it's uh, ensuring that the police have the training, uh, the tools, and the support they need. Uh, and that, again, gets back to it. what happens on the dais matters. Words matter. Um, and when we have a current city council member, uh, when, the, when the new police chief gets sworn in, saying that it's not the matter of a bad apple, we have a rotten tree at the police department, I think that words hurt. Um, and it's important that, yes, Civilian oversight um, matters, but so does words at the dais, and we need to make, ensure the police are getting the kind of support that they need. They have very stressful jobs. Candidate Strauss. When I talk about being a turnkey candidate, this is what I'm talking about. I've already been working with Downtown Seattle Association to identify which of the leases need to not be renewed along Third Avenue so that the problem businesses don't continue to be problems. I've had the opportunity in Councilmember Sally Bagshaw's office to work on City Hall Park, Prefontaine Place, and Fortson Square. If you look up uh, on the news, we've been working to condemn derelict buildings that have been falling in and becoming a blight on the community. Uh, we've also been working on Fortson Square to ensure that new cultural uh, Chief Seattle Club has everything that they need to build a place for people to live and receive services and to turn places that are not functioning well as public spaces into community gathering spaces. So Fortson Square, there's an art piece there. It's literally called The Ruins. It, I mean, it's called The Ruins. And there's, you know, cobblestones. It's not a place that people can access easily. I've already been working with Pioneer Square Preservation Board. I know where the obstacles are. We've been working with the uh, Courthouse Vicinity Improvement Project. And the judges down there will say that we've made more improvement in the last 20, this year than in the last 20 years. All right, thank you. Police reform advocates have raised the issue that the mayor and city council agreed to police contracts, union contracts last year that didn't follow through on promised reforms in the city's police accountability system that's used when there's an allegation of misconduct by an officer. Now, a federal judge has been critical as well. And the police community, community police commission is asking city leaders to change the labor contracts to fully implement the new law. Where are you on this issue? Is there a specific change that you think is the most vital? How would you treat this contract issue? Well, I, I believe that uh, the city council's role is actually just to 
thumbs up or thumbs down on the contract. Um, we need to ensure that our city leaders respect the collective bargaining agreement um, within the police department. So I, I think that the city's uh, council is out of its role, and I think that it's uh, incumbent upon the mayor to ensure that we have a contract moving forward um, to ensure that, the, again, the police are getting the support that they need from city leaders. Yeah, labor, the labor movement and labor unions have brought us the weekends, family paid medical leave, things that 15 minute breaks, eight hour work days, I mean the things that we rely on. And so to go against a labor contract, a labor negotiation is not something that I'm interested in breaking. What we know is that there is an accountability framework that is set in place, that we know what it looks like, that would relieve us from being under the consent decree. We know this because it was already passed. We know what the framework looks like because it was set in place. And we were even a year through our two year probationary period. Now because this was revoked through the labor negotiations, we have restarted probate. We haven't actually even restarted probation. We're just back under the consent decree fully. And we need to we need to be relieved from this consent decree so that we can get it off our backs and continue to support the police department in the best ways possible. And what that means is that we need to have an account accountability framework put in place. I'd love to work with the Seattle Police Department and the labor unions to get this done. All right, moving on to our next topic of affordable housing. Candidate Wills, earlier this year, you were quoted as saying, neighborhoods are what makes Seattle special. And candidate Strauss, you've also vowed to quote, keep what makes Seattle unique as we grow and change. So how would you maintain the character of places like Finney Ridge, Ballard, Fremont, even though there is a need for more housing to handle these population increases? How do you reconcile the two? And I will address that question to you first, candidate Wills. Um, first, I'll say uh, why affordable housing is really important to me personally, that I moved 13 times before I graduated from high school. Um, that's a, a lot of um, moving around and it's hard on families and it's hard on children. So uh, having affordable housing, uh, housing of all shapes and sizes for people of all income levels in our community is really important. Um, I'll say also that this issue is very polarized and it wasn't when I was on the city council to the same degree. We could talk about having neighborhood character and talk about including more housing within our community. In fact, I have fl flyers when I ran for city council that say just that. But I think in order to get there, we need to involve the community in those conversations. And people have not felt like they've had a meaningful voice in those conversations. I would like to bring back neighborhood planning. When I was on the city council, it was a very robust process under Jim Deers' leadership within the Department of Neighborhoods. We need more housing in our community, and I think that's the best way to get there. Candidate Strauss. Our community has changed so much. I mean, I learned to park, my, I learned to park in the Denny's parking lot. The, the dentist that I've gone to my entire life is now replaced with the Valdeck you know, apartment condominium on 56th and, and 17th. Uh, the Ludafisk factory that I had my 18th birthday party in is now the Vic apartment buildings. Um, our community's changed, you know. Uh, sometimes it feels like I'm walking through a ghost town of the, only seeing the ghosts of yesteryear. And you know what's also changed is the vibrancy of downtown, Ballard. Uh, I've never seen this many, you know, headlights and, and taillights. I, when I was growing up, the, you could take a successful business and put it on Market Street and it would fail in three months because the only thing that was down there was Lombardi's. And you know, what we see today is you can't find enough, enough space for the new businesses to come in and pop in. And so we need to have affordable housing because as I said, the kids I grew up with can't afford to live here. I, can, I have a good job that works for the city representing the interests of our community and I can barely afford to live here. And so we need to have more rent restricted uh, units so that you're not paying more than a third of your rent. Um, this is through public development authorities uh, such as Capitol Hill Housing and public development authority in our community. All right, and, and, and forgive me, um, a follow-up question because part of the argument about affordable housing and one way to address that is through upzoning. 
Uh, in 30 seconds, could I each have, have each of you follow up with how do you feel about upzoning and where specifically do you think it would apply in the neighborhoods that you represent here in District 6? 30 seconds each, please, starting with candidate Wills. You know, that gets back again to what I'd like to say about neighborhood planning. I think that people are frustrated that one size fits all upzoning um, is not necessarily the best solution to include more housing opportunities in the city of Seattle. I've been, I'm from Lake City. There's many parts of Lake City where people would like to have more height. Um, there's places in South Seattle where I've worked for the last 13 years that people would like to have additional height as well. Um, and that's close to transportation centers where it really makes sense to have more density. Um, and I think that there's also parts, okay, time up, but I think we should include neighborhood planning in these conversations. Thank you, Candidate Wills. Candidate Strauss. Yeah, we need to have more density in our communities and we need to protect the vibrancy of our communities. And so that means that we need to have transportation the false narrative is that we have a transportation network, we have the sewer systems, we have the infrastructure that goes along with this increased density. When I talk about the old Denny's on 15th and Market, why didn't we go higher? We could have required more affordable housing to be put in place or the, in, these in lieu fees that should also be used in our, our communities and not just filtered out to other places. Um, uh, time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right, we'll keep talking about transportation. Do you support creating more protected bike lanes at the expense of taking away parking availability for drivers? Candidate Strauss, we'll start with you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm gonna talk about trans transit only lanes and protected bike lanes. I shared a little bit earlier that when I was hit by a car while I was, drive while I was riding my bike, I spent 48, hour 48 hours in the ICU and, and in the ER. So 36 hours in the e ICU and four days at Harborview. Uh, statistically speaking, I should not be alive. And that's why I'm always smiling, because every day is a bonus day. Um, you know, and so when we look at protected bike lanes, we need to have a connected network, because nobody's going to use one section of protected bike lane that pops you out into a very busy intersection that is very dangerous for you to navigate, only to maybe jump back into another protected bike lane area. What we know, you know, five years ago, parking in front of small businesses was critical because we didn't have the amount of people living in our community that was needed to be able to support those businesses. That's changed. We know that with a busload of people will serve more customers than a couple cars parked out front. Thank you. Candidate Wells. Yes, I'll start by saying I'm an avid cyclist. I've bicycled across the country, and I, was, I got around solely by bicycle in the city of Seattle until my children were born. Um, we absolutely need to have more protected bike lanes in our community, and that's probably one of the reasons why three times as many people who choose to cycle are men than women. Um, and we need to ensure that it feels and is safe. Um, and at the same time, we need to have a balanced approach. I think that we've had uh, too much polarization on this issue, and we need to recognize that not everyone can cycle. Um, there's a number of people who have disabilities or might be too old or our families carting children around our community, so we need to ensure that we have a balanced multimodal approach to be able to get around our community. Um, I've been on the board of Transportation Choices Coalition, and we know that we need to provide more choices for people uh, so that they can also get around our community without a car. Follow up, and candidate Wills, I'll start with you here. Where would you put a protected bike lane? What, Give me a specific location where you see the need in this district. When I, one idea that I've been advancing, I'm glad I get this opportunity, is uh, I've been advancing um, the idea of an elevated trail along Shul Shul. Um, and part of the reason for that is I w voted to have an extension of the missing link on Shul Shul. But I have come to see how much uh, polarization there is on that community that has, it has not moved forward in the 16 years since I voted on that issue. And I'm hoping we can have a win-win solution that protects the maritime and industrial community as well as a protected uh, lanes for our cycling and recreational community with an elevated trail. Thank you. Candidate Strauss. You know, we, we look at the bicycle master plan and the implementation plan and it is years and years behind schedule. And this is why bicycling in our community is so dangerous. We need to follow the recommendations from that plan. When we look at our, you know, and that includes Fourth Avenue downtown, that includes you know, connections to the Seattle Center, and includes places throughout South Seattle. Uh, when I look at, you know, Ballard, uh, 
you know, it's not only do we need to complete the missing link, we need to have additional protected bike lanes in addition to it. Because as we continue to see emerging technologies, electrified mobility, whether it's bikes, scooters, solo wheels, skate longboards, we know that these are going to be the modes of transportation that are going to be using these protected bike lanes. Uh, so we're going to need them throughout the city. Thank you. Staying on transportation, uh, for an extra $450 million, Sound Transit says it could build a central uh, Ballard Tunnel and Underground Station. Do you support that option, or do you support some of the less expensive alignments, such as along 14th or 15th Avenue, or an elevated bridge and station? And how would you pay for it? Uh, Strauss. Yeah, so just to clarify that that $450 million is a tunnel no matter where it goes, um, it, n whether it's downtown Ballard or on 14th, 15th. And so what I can tell you is being staff on Sound Transit 3 at the city, I know all of the conversations that have already happened. I know that Sound Transit will try and say, oh, we didn't say that three years ago. And I can tell them, yes, you did. Um, these are the ways that you hold the feet to the fire to ensure that we are getting what we paid for. They. Um, there's ways that we can streamline permitting using public right away. We can have a lot of in-kind donations. We can also work with the county, the state, and the port. The port the, all of these entities are also finding a benefit in having us having a, a tunnel because the tunnel will increase reliability and frequency of service. It will also allow us to expand those lines better. Um, and we can always go back to the federal government for more money once we get a new president. <laughs> I also support the tunnel um, for the reasons of reliability of the system as a whole. Um, but I, I think that we're, how to pay for it is uh, the crux. And just like we renovated uh, Ballard Locks with help from our women senators, I think we also need to look to them for help from the federal government um, for this system as well. Um, but what's really concerning to me is Initiative 976 on the ballot in November. Um, if that passes, um, these questions are purely theoretical. That is the most important issue on the ballot, more important than Dan and I on the ballot is that issue. And please vote no. All right, moving on to our next topic of business and taxes. And this question will be addressed to candidate Strauss first. Would you have supported a head tax on larger businesses to fund more homeless services and housing? And do you support additional taxes of any kind for these services? You know, I have my entire campaign not relitigated the head tax because it has created a divisive community in our city. It's a year and a half, almost two years later, and we're still talking about the head tax, and we have not made any meaningful contributions to addressing the housing and homelessness crisis. That's what this conversation was supposed to be about. So here we are, a year and a half, two years later, we haven't made any meaningful contributions and we're still arguing. I absolutely, you know, when we look at do we need more revenue to address the housing and homelessness crisis, most likely the question, that, that answer is yes. Because when we're looking at the capital costs for permanent supportive housing, these are very high costs. You know, we can definitely find more efficiencies within our programs. That's why I've already said we need performance metrics to ensure that we're funding the programs that are working and not funding the ones that aren't. And we're going to need to build permanent supportive housing to address the housing and homelessness crisis. We, can we need to be using our bonding capacity to its fullest ability. And we have just seen a proposal in the last couple of days that would start this process. Candidate Wills. No, I, I don't support the head tax or bringing back the head tax, um, but um, I think that the, the question really is, do we need more funding so that we have permanent supportive housing to address the root causes of homelessness? Yes. Can Seattle solve this uh, crisis in a silo? No. Um, we know that we need to engage regional partners and the state to address these questions. And we need a regional tax package, but people don't have an appetite for that until they see a plan and they know how those dollars will be best utilized. Um, I think the problem with the head tax is that it got called the Amazon tax. And there were many small businesses and family uh, businesses that would have been affected by that. Yuwajamaya, Dick's Drive-In, Dunn Lumber, Fisheries Supply told me that they would have moved out of the city of Seattle. And they are an important part of the ecosystem of the maritime industry in Ballard. I think that we need to think about this holistically and what the effects and consequences are. 
And just a quick follow-up, given the examples you gave of businesses that would have been affected, um, to you, uh, Candidate Strauss, would you support any type, if you were to support these types of taxes, not specifically the head tax, but what types and what size of business would you think that would be best applied toward? You know, I would like to see the proposals of before me, before I'm answering questions in theoretical fashions, uh, and I'll use the example just from this week. The Lyft and Uber tax is a great way that we can generate just as much, if not more, dollars than the head tax would have generated. And what this does is it creates worker protections, makes sure that drivers are receiving the minimum wage that have already been, that we've already passed here in the city, and we've got dollars to fund transportation projects and build housing. Thank you very much. We'll start with candidate Wills on this question. Do you believe city council is too accommodating to Amazon or too hostile? And can you give an example? I think that's another polarized issue in our community. We could just keep ticking them off. Um, I would say that the city council, of course, needs to work with businesses of all sizes in our community that are employing people who live in our community, raising families in our community. And to demonize any business is not going to produce anything constructive and I think that that's why it's important to have people on the City Council who can work with all stakeholders who can work with business who can work with labor uh, who can work with our regional partners um, I've worked at King County for six years I think it's important to be able to engage the broader region on these questions because it's not for Seattle to solve these challenges in a silo candidate Strauss can you repeat the question sure do you believe city council is too accommodating to Amazon or too hostile? And can you give an example? Yeah, so I mean, I would agree with my friend standing next to me. That's a question that doesn't really get at the root of the city's problems right now. You know, when I was in AmeriCorps serving low income communities all across our nation, uh, it was in 2008, 2009, after the last recession. And I saw communities all across our nation foreclosed. I mean, this was like, the areas of Greenwood and Finney Ridge, that entire swath of land foreclosed. Here in Seattle, we saw a slowdown. We didn't have entire communities foreclosed. We did have foreclosures occurring. And so, you know, there's benefits. And at the same time, we are, our, our problems today are because of our success. The reason that there's a housing affordability crisis is because there are a lot of high wage earners in our community. The fact, you know, and this is what has led to, to homelessness, the fact that we don't have affordable housing for people. And so the problems that we have today are because of our successes, and Seattle is strong. We do have the solutions, and we know how to get it done. Could I add something to that? Uh, we, we're going to keep okay. moving All because right. we have quite a few questions okay. that we'd like to get to our audience questions, but I would like to uh, let All Jim right. Bruner take the next one. First part of this, Candidate Wills. Candidate Wills, you lost your seat on the city council in 2003 in part due to a controversy over campaign donations connected to you know a relatively minor matter it was a, a uh, parking lot expansion that you went out of your way to show up at a committee and support um, what did you learn from that episode and how are you scrutinizing campaign donations and people who might be seeking to to influence you now I would say that um, I'm really glad we have a democracy voucher program, um, which I've embraced and, um, and I have uh, succeeded early in qualifying for uh, the most dem democracy vouchers in the race. Um, I also think that it, Google is your friend. So I didn't know who the Curlicaccio family was, nor their relationship to Governor Al Rosalini, because um, this was all pre-Google. This was 16 years ago. Um, so I've learned to ask better questions since then. Um, but I'll also say that there's a lot of misinformation out there about what this issue is about and what it's not about. And that I'm happy to talk with anyone who has uh, any concerns about this issue. My cell phone is on my website. Um, and that also if you have any concerns about my judgment or character, that people who I have worked with and, and have known for decades are supporting my campaign, from Ron Sims to Gary Locke to Bob Ferguson. Um, I think what's most important is that what I've learned since then as a working mom, a small business owner, and nonprofit director, those are the experiences that I also bring to the table. 
and candidate Strauss, just slightly yeah. different for you, you have different history. Um, sure. You work for a council member on Business City Hall. You've worked for other legislators. Yeah. Now you're, you're running for office. People are, you know, approaching you with campaign donations. Is there, are, are you on the lookout to make sure that you're not, you know, allowing the politics and the, the donations to influence your work? Or how do, you, how do you view that issue? How do you be careful if you are elected? Yeah, and you know, I went to Nathan Hale, which was right around the corner. Um, and we knew who all, we knew who everyone in the community was at that time. We know that high school students are smart. Um, we know that high school students are leading the way with climate change, and we need to follow their lead today as well. So you know, while we're sitting here running for office, we also need to be looking to what the high school students know. Um, when talking about campaign donations, yeah, absolutely. There were people who have tried to influence me, and I've returned the uh, first two weeks of this campaign. I returned to donations, democracy vouchers at that because I don't need to have people's money when I've got a grassroots campaign. I have surpassed you in the amount of democracy vouchers, and I have the most and the highest number of donors uh, for this campaign, and I've maintained that lead, and I've got the highest number of the D6 donors as well. So I'm excited to have a grassroots campaign here so that I don't have to listen to any one special interest. All right, we're going to move on to some of our audience questions at this time. And uh, for both candidates, what can the city do to make sure the new mother-in-law apartments and backyard cottages are affordable for people who make less than $50,000 a year? Candidate Strauss. Yeah, absolutely. So right now, there's no way that we can necessarily restrict that. Um, there are provisions in the law right now that um, you know require a second ADU to be built with green building codes, and that could in the future work to be somehow restricted to, to their rent um, if, if changes at the state law were ever to occur. Um, we need to make sure that these, and one of the most important ways that this last bill changed the laws was it made these structures to be more affordable to build. When we have very high construction cost, it's not very easy for people to rent them at a low rate. And that's why having them larger and higher and taller uh, allows for traditional building materials to be used rather than having to find these specialized materials for smaller units. Um, we need to be able to have our, our parents and our kids be able to live in our communities. We need to be able to use the entirety of our lot so that we're not using up all of our green space for concrete. Candidate Wills. You know, I, I support ADUs. It's actually a very modest increase in the number of housing units that will become available. Um, we have about 1,000 now, and it's estimated in the next 10 years with that legislation we'll get only another 1,400 of them. So it's not enough to ensure that we have more affordable housing for people in our community who are working in our community. These are doctors and um, people who are our baristas and people who cut our hair. Um, these are firefighters that, we, that are working in Seattle and need to have a place to live close to the, where they work. I think that the changes that we could see made are on the mandatory housing affordability legislation, the MHA, where developers can put money into a fund to be used off-site, which will likely be in South Seattle, where I've worked for the last th 13 years, continuing to bifurcate our community on economic lines. Why not have developers include affordable housing in their developments in our community too? Integration is really healthy for communities. And let's give these developers the front of the line for the permitting process. All right, we'd like to get to another audience question. This, this member of the audience wants to know, if elected, will you work cooperatively with the Seattle business community to solve issues of mutual concern? And they make a point to say they don't feel like that is happening now. I will start with candidate Wills. I would echo that as a small business owner uh, myself. Um, and that may be part of the reason why I have the support of uh, the business community in this race. Our, our Greater Seattle Chamber of Commerce, 80% of the membership represents small businesses like mine in our community. I think that it's vitally important that that is one of the stakeholders that city council members are able to reach out to and work with. Because if we have strong neighborhood business districts, we have strong neighborhoods. And that's part of what makes Seattle great is our independent uh, businesses in our neighborhood districts. I, I think that the city council can be doing much more to support small business. Candidate Strauss. I will absolutely be working with small businesses to make sure that their concerns are met. 
Um, my entire my entire life, I've been going down to small. I had lunch today at the Other Coast Cafe in downtown Ballard. Um, I have coffee down there all the time. I mean, th this is my community. These are the places that I have been a customer at longer than some of the other folks that were running in this race before have been part of our community. And so, you know, it's really important for me to be accessible. Uh, and that's why I wanted to open a district office so that people don't have to figure out how to get downtown, find parking or use the bus for the first time and navigate into City Hall to get through all the closed doors just to find me. That's why I'm going to be in community working with our small business owners, working with our, our neighbors to address the, the most critical problems that they face. Thank you, candidate Strauss. Um, not sure we got this question specifically from the audience, but I was down at Seattle City Hall yesterday and I saw a lot of teenagers who would probably like you to answer this question about what would a Seattle Green New Deal look like? What realistically could the city do along the lines of a New Deal? And what maybe is maybe out of the purview of, of a city Green New Deal? Uh, candidate Wills. I was there too. Um, and that was the climate strike uh, led by youth who were by far the most powerful speakers uh, with thousands of people in attendance. Um, I was the champion for climate protection when I was on the city council 20 years ago. And this is the issue that has called me to public service. I started the campus recycling program at the University of Washington when I was student body president. I pushed through the U-Pass bus pass program so every student would have a bus pass on their ID card. We know moving forward that what's important is transportation in order to lower our global warming footprint in this community. So we need to vote no on initiative 976. We also know that we could electrify this city um, through Seattle City Light, which is net neutral for greenhouse gases. That's the legislation that I wrote. I also pushed forward renewables like wind power. I helped create the green power program, which you can help fund solar projects in our community when you pay your utility bill. I've served on the board of Climate Solutions for over 10 years. I have the support of the Sierra Club. I think it's important to the people of District 6 that we have a climate leader representing us on the city council. Candidate Strauss. I've known my whole life the importance of climate change. No one have ever had to convince me. And it's really nice to see the youth of our community holding us accountable because it's true that for me and for them, we may not, this world could very well burn in our lifetime. And that's why for me, everything that I do, all of my policies are put through a climate perspective. That's why I want to see transit only lanes so that we can allow people who don't want to rely on their cars to get out of their cars. That's why I want to see electrified modes of transportation, being able to have space in our community to get around safely. That's why I want to see green building codes. That's why I want to see solar being required in all of the buildings so that, because we know that renovation costs to put in projects like solar or electric charging vehicle, vehicle charging stations can be the prohibitive costs. This is why I want to pass the tree ordinance. I've already been working on the tree ordinance. You want to talk again? turnkey candidate, I've been working on the tree ordinance and I will be able to get it done to protect our tree canopy and make sure that we have a cool community that creates oxygen. All right, moving on to our lightning round, if you have your cards ready. Yes, no, waffle. We have three quick questions and then we will get to your closing statements. <laughs> First question, do you support congestion pricing for downtown streets? Yes or no? With equity concerns Ditto. addressed. Ditto. Hmm. All right. Do you support building a new North Police precinct? That's a yes for both. <laughs> yes for it, both. It's already being built. Both candidates <laughs> answering yes. Do you support safe injection sites? Okay, candidate Will saying no, candidate Strauss saying yes, and um, very quickly in, in 30 seconds, Yes, why do, you, why do you support them? Why do you not? Candidate Wills, why do you not? Um, I've uh, visited Vancouver, the InSight. I toured the InSight safe injection site. Of course, people care about harm reduction, but I cannot imagine that in Seattle, let alone in District 6. There are so many people suffering from opiate use disorder, 23,000 in King County alone. One of these sites can serve between three and 500 people. It's just not scalable. And it's expensive at one and a half million dollars per site. Those public funds would be better spent on treatment on demand. 
quickly, Candidate Strauss. Yeah, absolutely. I support it because harm reduction models work. This is how we address the HIV outbreak here in North Seattle. We also know that this is not a legally viable path. And so this is a conversation that we're having in a vacuum where this is not actually going to exist. When the King County uh, Heroin and Prescription Opiate Task Force approved this proposal unanimously, we saw that two sites would be located. This would not likely be located in our community. And we know that using the dollars that are already set up to, form, uh, to fund harm reduction models, medically assisted treatment, this is how we're going to this is how we're going to serve our community. Does it, addiction is a disease right. that can be dealt with with medical uh, interventions. Thank you, Candidate Strauss. Your closing statements at this time, we will begin with you, Candidate Strauss. Yeah. Thank you for having me tonight. As I said, I was born and raised in our community. I went to Adams Elementary and Whitman Middle School. I want to funnel our growth so that we can have an equitable, sustainable, and affordable city that, every, that works for everyone, whether you just moved here this year or you've been here for four generations. I've dedicated my life to public service. I've served in AmeriCorps. I served in soup kitchens while I was in, a, in college. And I've continued to serve our community here through my decade of policy experience and writing advocacy manuals so that everyday people can influence their legislators. Uh, we've talked about addressing homelessness. I've had a consistent position for the last seven months of this campaign. I'm glad to see my friend next to me uh, walking away from talking about sweeps and start talking about public permanent supportive housing. I think the quotes that we heard about the three days at Harborview or three months in jail, that was my Facebook post yesterday, so I'm glad that we're both on the same page about that today. Um, you know, I'm here to serve our community, and I've been delivering for our community since I was delivering the Ballard News Tribune. Um, you know, we've got, I know where the opportunities and the roadblocks are at City Hall. I know how to get this job done. I'm not going to have the same tricks played on me as somebody who's new to, to the community, new to council. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to serving you. And that's why I want to open a district office so you don't have to go out of your way to find me so that I'm always accessible to you. Thank you for your support and I look forward to earning your vote. Candidate Wells. I'll just mention quickly, Dan, that I didn't get that uh, from your Facebook page. <laughs> um, and I happened to be at the Plymouth Housing Group luncheon supporting that really important organization which builds permanent supportive housing in our community yesterday where they talked about that. I was walking with my daughter recently when she said something that really struck with me. She said, Seattle's the most important city in the world. I think so, but I asked why she did. And she looked at me like it was obvious. And she said, because we live here. <laughs> Local issues matter. My campaign's knocked on over 21,000 doors and I've talked to thousands of people. People's uh, dissatisfaction with this city council is palpable. People are almost shouting, prioritize core services, public safety, clean parks, open community centers, better transportation, more affordable housing, and effectively addressing the root causes of homelessness. We haven't had a mom with teenage children on the council in this millennium. As a working mom, former council member, climate leader, small business owner, and nonprofit director, I bring a broad perspective and I have broad support. From labor, business, the Seattle Firefighters, the Sierra Club, the Seattle Times, the Sailors Union of the Pacific, which is core to the maritime industry in Ballard, and dozens of progressive leaders, including Reuven Carlisle, Jamie Peterson, Bob Ferguson, Hilary Franz, Dow Constantine, Gail Tarleton, Jim McDermott, and many more. And that's because I've been fighting the fight and working on these issues in our community for the last three decades. I'm hopeful, collaborative, and effective. I care deeply about our community, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. And that concludes tonight's debate. Thank you for watching Seattle City Club's District 6 City Council debate. Thank you to our candidates, Heidi Wills and Dan Strauss. And thanks again to our sponsors, presenting sponsor Amazon, supporting sponsor AARP, and our host sponsor, the Finney Neighborhood Association. And thanks to all of you for attending.